Thank you, Melissa, for the introduction. And then apologies in advance. I have a tough situation this morning. So please bear with me. I'll try to uh, be clear. OK, so this is, uh, this is a reading project. Uh, we've been working on this for two years. And the goal here is to deploy a, uh, so I'm a crop physiologist by training. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to get a sense of the physiology of the crop in terms of health and performance uh, in a way that enable breeders to screen a large, numbers, uh, large number of genotypes. Um, so <clears throat> the entry point for us is looking at canopy, right? So um, for wheat and for many crops, canopy is essentially the engine that um, basically drives yields. And there are many, many reasons for that. So essentially what they do is they capture light, energy from photons in order to, to, to fuel many biochemical reactions needed to generate those sugars, the starch that is needed to go into the uh, to, to seed and generate yield. Um, canopy also fixes food uh, in terms of CO2, atmospheric CO2. And uh, it performs also transpiration, which is the, effect, the, the, the fact of moving uh, water uh, from the soil into the atmosphere, pulling the water from, uh, for some reason, it's kind of activating itself, moving on its own. So uh, let me, oh, hopefully it stops here. And um, canopy also, uh, by generating this tension in the water column for transpiration, for moving water from the soil into, into the plants, it also moves uh, uh, important nutrients from the soil into the plant, essentially uh, mobile nutrients like, uh, like nitrogen. So canopy is doing a lot of work, right? So it's the engine that fuels uh, the yield. So breeders typically uh, have landscapes like this when they do their breeding process. They have hundreds and hundreds of entries with canopies like, that look like this. And the question for them, and this is the question that was, uh, was asked as, as a physiologist, how do we determine the champion versus the loser when we look at canopies like this? And the entry point for this, uh, for this uh, uh, question is, was re relatively straightforward for us, which is to look at infrared thermography. And th the principle is relatively straightforward. This is an example from actual scientific paper on humans. And the idea is that um, in terms of uh, physiological performance, uh, a well-performing athlete will have the ability to cool himself while performing effort. You can see here uh, a larger proportion of blue areas which are cooler compared to an underperforming tired athlete. And that actually applies to many biological systems, including plants. So the organism or the variety that is able to keep uh, its temperature in an optimal range performs better than the one that is, uh, that is overheating. And we have a, a kind of a, a good framework for this. So what we think is that uh, the genotypes with cooler canopy will be able to perform very well on, for these uh, key functions that I just uh, outlined, essentially because of these functions are biochemical. So re they, re they, uh, they rely on biological reactions for which uh, uh, temperature, optimal temperature is important. And uh, warmer canopies are uh, obviously hurt, hurtful to uh, all of these uh, uh, biochemical reactions as well. Okay, so to, to do this, to be able to measure canopy temperature in a high throughput way, because remember this is for reading purposes, so we, it's a numbers game, we need to be able to do this on a large number of entries, we devised a uh, three-step approach. Uh, which is to measure uh, temperature on three levels. First of all, we wanted to, we needed to uh, measure uh, temperature exactly as is sensed by the plant. So for that, we, would, uh, we deployed thermocouples, which are sensors that you stick on the leaves and that will give you the temperature as sensed by uh, the plant itself. Uh, on days when it's not possible to fly the drone, which, is tip which are typically uh, windy days, we use uh, handheld uh, uh, equipment, uh, which, are, which is represented here. These are actual images from our plots. And uh, on days where you can fly the drone, uh, basically you have those types of uh, images. You fly it over the field and you take images and you process them. And I'm going to de develop that in a minute. <clears throat> okay, so um, 
All right, proof of concept study. We started playing with the idea uh, when working on oats in the three year study. And uh, in this case, we had uh, a group of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, seven genotypes uh, that uh, were selected because they had differential ability to tolerate heat stress. And our hypothesis for oat was the ones that are performing better under heat stress are able to cool themselves. And that's exactly what we see here. This is the um, false color picture from uh, one of those flights using the infrared thermal camera on these plots. What I want to draw your attention is to this figure here where you have this correlation between uh, fluoric fertility and canopy temperature. The reason why we look at fluoric fertility is that our hypothesis was that the champions are able to maintain high yield under heat stress by cooling the florets by, their, by transpiration. So they're protecting the seed from overheating. And that's exactly what we see here. So the, the genotypes that are warmer are, incur higher yield losses because of floss in florid fertility. This was an oath. The question, all right, does this work on, um, on, on weeds? And for us, the research objectives here were twofold. Uh, first of all, to develop this promising technology uh, on a high throughput level, because remember, this was like uh, a study on seven genotypes. We want to do this on hundreds and hundreds of lines, so that, that requires some scaling up. And, and then deploy it to uh, help the breeder identify superior varieties and hopefully even identify genetic markers associated with this performance, which, which would be for us the, the top objective. <clears throat> so we had two, uh, two strategies for this. A uh, two-step strategy. So first of all, to fine-tune the technology, and I'm not going to develop too much uh, this part, which is because it's highly technical. The, the core idea is to um, improve the signal-to-noise ratio because you have many reasons why you can have in the field variation in temperature. It could be the microclimate, it could be some feedback loops in there, and we want to capture biological signatures as opposed to environmental signatures. So there's some some, uh, some uh, uh, algorithmic and, uh, uh, and, and, and data analysis that goes into there. And then uh, hopefully, hopefully identify superior breeding lines uh, for which canopy cooling is associated with, uh, with higher yield and uh, ideally to capture favorable genes in the U of M wheat pro uh, breeding program. Okay, so we had two experiments for this. I'm gonna start with the first one. Um, and we go up with the throughput first. We test small hypotheses and then we go after the, the big ones. And here the question for wheat was whether we, we can detect differences between uh, lazy and uh, hardworking canopies using this method. So uh, to this end, we selected a group of two groups of 22 lines. You see that we're already increasing the throughput here a little bit compared to the oat study. So we are in the two digit, two digit realm. And uh, these two groups of 22 lines were selected for a reason. And the reason is that each group has a lazy or uh, hardworking version of a gene controlling um, canopy photosynthesis, which is one of those uh, uh, things that canopy does in order to, to achieve high yields. And uh, this is essentially, show this real quick. This comes from a paper we just, uh, we just published and actually study funded by you guys where uh, we, uh, we looked at uh, canopy trait in controlled environment. We were able to map very important genes and a hotspot here. And these genetic markers are now freely available to breeders in order for them to improve canopy photosynthesis. So what we did is that we selected one of these genes and we had each gene has, comes in two versions we call alleles, high performing and low performing. And uh, we ran an experiment in the field uh, to, to examine the differences between these, uh, these two groups. Okay, so we flew the drone, and this is an example of the visuals we have when we flew over these, uh, these single row plots, because the other factor here was that these experiments were conducted on single rows in order for us to see, okay, to what extent we are able to increase the numbers, also, uh, you know, play with, uh, with the plot size and see if we have uh, a good signal-to-noise ratio. So, you can see here, this is a typical um, a genotype with a cooler canopy com compared to, to this one. So you see differences in color. The darker here in the blue indicates cooler canopy compared to, to this one. So long story short, what we were able to find is that the lazy ones, as you can see here, uh, actually are 
significantly warmer than the hard-working ones. And this is, this is data from a single flight. You can see it also staying consistent over different days with slightly different environmental conditions. So the idea holds and the hypothesis works uh, for the single row plots for these numbers of lines. All right, now the question for us, uh, when we collaborate with breeders, the breeders are really interested in, in high numbers, uh, uh, screening high numbers of lines. So how do we scale this approach to uh, one order of magnitude higher? In this case, more than 400 lines, and actually it's in some cases more than 500 lines. Um, so this is the second project, and for, for now we have, uh, we have two uh, years of, uh, of trials. So these are preliminary yield trials uh, developed by, uh, with breeder Jim Anderson. So each year he has those promising uh, breeding lines for which he measures yield, and we deploy our uh, technology on those, uh, those plots. So the first year, we did this on 508 lines. Second year, which was last summer, on 468 uh, lines on, on yield-sized plots. In addition to these lines, we have four to five checks replicated 14 times. I'm going to go quickly over the, uh, the approach here. So each year we fly the drone 28 times uh, using two cameras, one RGB, one infrared, number of ground control pro, uh, points, 24 thermocouples for the ground truthing, and different st a complex strategy for data analysis, again, to improve the signal-to-noise uh, ratio, a lot of corrections, etc. So uh, just here an example to show you how... How this, how this works, so basically we have a drone that flies over a part of the, the, the trial and then rotates, flies the other way, and continues zigzagging like that until it covers the entire uh, uh, trial. We, this is in the visible spectrum, the, the, the RGB spectrum, and then we have another uh, video to show you how it works uh, in the infrared. Uh, I don't know if it works from here. I can press the button, it will be appreciated, yes. The same thing, a little bit accelerated. Um, and, and basically what we end up having are these two layers of images, one in, in the RGB, the visible, which allows us to separate green from the brown, and the brown being the soil, the green being the canopy, and now, once we identify the pixels that are green, we, uh, we overlay the, the thermal camera uh, data, and that's what allows us to select to, to count the, pixel, the pixels uh, from, from this uh, thermal camera data and, uh, and assign average temperatures to each plot. Okay, up. Oh. All right, so part of the procedure uh, uh, calls for stitching those images together based on the flight path of the drone. This is an example to show you how, how this is uh, being done. And there's some 3D rendering as well. A lot of corrections that I'm not going to dwell on too much today, at least in the talk portion. Um, this is an example of the, what the, the image looked like for the entire trial of uh, 560 yield plots here. Uh, this is a reasonably cool day. This is a warmer day. You could see already some plots being slightly warmer uh, uh, than, than the others. You will going to see the, the difference better numerically than, uh, rather than visually. All right. So here's how we analyze the data. Um, it might look like a little bit too, too technical here, but it's relatively straightforward. I'm going to try to uh, have, navigate this. So these are two of the four to five Czech cultivars. These are commercial varieties in the Jim Anderson's wheat program. Uh, here on the x-axis, you have air temperature in Celsius. So for instance, a temperature of 30 C, it's equivalent of 86 Fahrenheit. 35 C is 95 Fahrenheit. Uh, the numbers of data points here reflect the 14 replications. And this is the canopy temperature. These reflect different flight days. So what the S here it reflects the slope of this relationship. So what this means, the slopes, uh, slope of 1.2, indicates that uh, for each uh, increase in, uh, uh, in te air temperature by one degree, the canopy warms by 1.2 degrees. So it's 20% 20, 20 warmer than, uh, than the air. Uh, this is not good. This, this genotype here is not able to cool itself, at least compared to this other control uh, check variety, which is doing a slightly better job in terms of it's warming only 9% more than the surrounding air when it, when, it, when it warms up. So these are the checks. As I mentioned, we did more than 500 lines. I'm going to show you the extremes because breeding happens on the extremes. Um, these are genotypes uh, that actually doing a poor job 
in terms of uh, canopy cooling, because this one here warms up much more compared to the air temperature. So the slope here is 1.4, meaning that it's 40% warmer compared to uh, the surrounding air. The nice thing here, because we have a large number of genotypes, we're able to identify potentially promising ones, as you could see here. The slope here is less than the unit, meaning that for these two genotypes are able to cool themselves very effectively compared to the surrounding air. So this one is 60% cooler compared to this one. So when we compile all the data together, we have uh, what we call uh, a frequency distribution, which is nice and normal. Um, so obviously what we are interested in is are those genotypes on the this end of the spectrum with the slope less than one. So these are potentially desirable uh, breeding lines. And then you might ask, okay, that's nice. We have genotypes that cool themselves. What's the relationship with yield? Because at the end of the day, that's the main market here. That's what we want to uh, breed for. And uh, the result is, is quite interesting for us. So when we plot uh, this relationship between yield and the slope of the canopy temperature versus air temperature for all those 508 lines, we have a statistically significant and negative relationship in a sense that is in a direction that is consistent with our hypothesis, meaning that the guys that warms up too much relative to the air underperform relative to the guys that cool themselves. And those promising lines here, you can find them here. You can see that they are really performing well uh, uh, and because probably, very likely, because they are cooler. And this was possible to see because of the droughty conditions we had last year in St. Paul and the year before. And I, my sense is that the water deficit situation is, is across the state uh, uh, these years. So this indicates that this approach has potential in other locations as well. Uh, this year's data, uh, we're still in the process of analyzing the data. That's basic, basically the bottleneck for us. We have a lot of terabytes of data, and that's what takes a lot of time for us. So just a note there, technology is useful, but you need still brains and people to code and filter and humans to, to do the data analysis. Um, so the same relationship for the Czech cultivars and this year's data, so that's, uh, that's also uh, promising for us. Okay, so... Uh, what we want to do is uh, finish the data analysis of this year's, year's trial and uh, replicating the trial uh, one more time for the next year. And the idea is to uh, have enough uh, statistical resolution in order for us to uh, hopefully find markers associated with canopy temperature, uh, uh, yield response to canopy temperature. Um, so this work has, would not have been possible without the help of these guys uh, over here, and obviously a strong collaboration with uh, Jim Anderson, uh, the wheat breeder, so I would uh, thank them. And of course, your support and the support from the University of Minnesota. So thanks again for, for the opportunity and ready to take uh, questions. Thank you. I wonder if... Uh uh, the cooler canopy is related to a better rate of transpiration or if it's related somehow to the physiological processes in the plant and if, if this and how that might relate to say drought tolerance or something like that of the variety. Yes, very good question. So clearly the guys that are warmer are able to access more water, uh, particularly during the money making period, which is seed fill, right? And uh, we don't have uh, experimental data to, to find the mechanisms, but I think there are two main possibilities. Either they have deeper roots, so they kind of track the water table, or they're able to extract moisture that is not available to others deeper in the soil, or they are uh, of the water-saving uh, genotypes, meaning that they transpire less early in the season, so they bank water in the soil, which will use it later during seed fill, which for us shows up as cooler canopy. So it's clearly a drought-tolerant strategy, uh, but the, the mechanisms are not fully identified yet. 